Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, I'm Chris. I am Jesse. Welcome, welcome, hey. welcome. We got an action packed episode for today. We have uh, one of our Patreon sponsors, uh, Marv, has, we're going to be covering his topics, topics plural today. So we got we to, we got a work cut out for us. Marv gave us a, a, a list of things to cover. So we're going to try our best to, to get this all situated in like an hour, hour and a half or so. Could- yeah, I, he gave us an awesome, it's, it's a great list. It's very interesting topics, but it's, it's extensive. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're going to try to cover as much as we can. Yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say it's like, it's the personal touch you get when you're a Patreon, but we'll cover all questions if you send it to us. But if you're yeah. a Patreon, you get bumped to the top of the list. That's right. Like you're putting the extra dollar in at the jukebox when that used to be a thing. <laughs> going in public to a bar oh, yeah. i remember the good old days speaking of which we'll have to ask the formatting formula if they have any topics they want us to cover there they've been our uh you know patreon before patreon was patreon if you know what i'm saying <laughs> i think so well give me give me a second for let that sink in for a, but, right. they could probably format that sentence into they, they yeah, probably could. Could. Here in form. <laughs> to yes. grammar check as well <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes but uh formatting formula uh check them out formatting formula.com or youtube forward slash c forward slash formatting formula for all of your word formatting documentation needs um they're fantastic i i've used them several times um even even uh at work recently i had to format a document that basically make it into like a a fillable form and i i know there's a way to do it in word and i'm fumbling around trying to get it done and i was like you know what i'm just gonna email a formatting formula and be like can you help me with this and they said absolutely and they took it and they formatted the whole thing and then they sent it back to me and i was like oh shoot i forgot something and they said no problem and it literally the whole process took like 20 minutes where it would have taken me like probably 10 hours because <laughs> i'm just i'm now spoiled because anything that comes up with formatting in word i just send it to the formatting formula and they hooked me up so please please check them out and also please tell them the geology flannel cast sent you because you know Let's face it. We want them to continue being our sponsor. Yeah. In addition to our wonderful Patreons, we have uh, Dennis and Mark listening in live right now. So uh, kudos to you guys. Thank you. Uh, and like we said earlier, we are going to get to Marv's list. Can't wait. Do we want to? Um, that was very smooth, by the way. That might have been the smoothest intro that we yeah. ever had. I just know when I sit here and I edit these things and I hear Jesse critiquing how unsmooth our intros are every week (laughs) during the unsmooth intro i well yeah i didn't i was almost about to blow it because when we were the thing we were talking about right before we came on i I had a thought that popped in my head Uh, just gonna shout it out yeah off the off the yeah it was about a movie i just watched and (laughs) i was like no no let's stay on task it was the movie Um, war game (laughs) (laughs) So do we – actually, we didn't even talk about this before we started. Do we want to start off with a news story today? I saw someone – I guess Jesse sent that – did you want to talk about that, that link did. he sent? The Earth yes. What, uh, sure. I don't care. What do, what yeah. do you want to- I was going to throw out um, – yesterday was uh, – <clears throat> at the moment, it looks like the hottest temperature ever recorded at Death Valley. Oh, I saw that 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That is that's What's not that? not fit for humans. Yeah, what was it like 54 Celsius? You, I think you better get this right because they'll come at you. 54.4. Look at that hit the, hit the nail on the head. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, that was just sort of a little little thing I saw. I have nothing else to say about it. Death Valley's hot. <laughs> yeah, uh, friends with 
some dude on Facebook and he just posted a picture of his thermometer and it was 117. Ooh. He lives in California. I was like, oh. That actually, I'd be interested in, maybe I'll poke around for next week. Why Death Valley is so hot? Like, what are the, what are the reasons for the conditions? Don't tell me if you know, because I want to find out on my own. I love that. I just, the joy of understanding knowledge. Don't. All right. Don't. <laughs> Jesse can actually hear the podcast listeners screaming into their speakers right now. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> no, no. How did you get this far in life? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, come back next week and be like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I need to make a note of this because I'll forget. All right. You got a dry erase board now? I've got, I've got like the tiniest post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> Very efficient. Those are almost like those like sign here notes. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I could take this one that says Wednesday, August 5th down. Um, Steve, did you want to talk about your story? Uh, sure. It was just a, it was a, just an interesting um, phenomenon that I didn't even really know existed. That uh, It's called a boomerang earthquake was observed along the Atlantic ocean fault line. Uh, and a boomerang earthquake, well, an earthquake is when, you know, basically rocks are under some sort of strain and they slip, right? A fault forms in the mm-hmm. rock, they break, you know, the the rock is displaced. That amount of energy that's released when those rocks break is the magnitude of the earthquake. Um, but I had never heard of a boomerang earthquake. Apparently during large earthquakes, you know, the the rupture happens and that earthquake is, is shooting that energy shooting along that fault line, right? Right where that rupture mm-hmm. happened. Okay. Um, and, and it usually just goes away from, you know, the energy is released here and it goes away. Well, every, um, every once in a while, these earthquakes can actually like reflect and come back down the fault line towards where it initially happened and it comes back faster than it left, which is huh. mind blowing. So it, it has to do with like resonance and, yeah. and yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that much about it, but I, you know, that just the fact that, um, this can happen is really pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the first, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't know anything about these boom. I never yeah. heard of a boomerang earthquake until literally two minutes ago when you started talking about them. But, you know, that's, that's interesting, like how the speed of sound changes. Seismic waves are moving at the speed of sound. It is a sound. Yes. So that's, that's interesting how that. Well, no, there's, there's, there's different types of waves, though. Yeah. Oh, that's probably. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. their, their velocity changes with like elasticity and whatnot. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not constant. So then it must some how the the type of wave must change then well i think what steve was saying like <clears throat> it's is it yeah like it the residence it, there's constructive or destructive interference that causes it to yeah and again I, you know they're, they no. they they measured it with a seismographic network and and actually saw this so yeah if you think about like interference ripples coming from a sedimentary background here there you go. The, the same idea with the, the waves propagating out. There'll be parts where they, I guess, they overlap or they don't overlap, and that can cause changes in velocity. I mm, sort of yeah. talking out my exactly. But basically, what it was like, you know, th- they saw this stress building up. They they saw the earthquake and they expected it uh-huh. to do one thing, and it it didn't. It it was bigger and did. Um, reacted differently than they expected it to so this is interesting and could have impacts and and it's usually they say it's usually only on uh larger earthquakes like seven or above on the magnitude scale so oh, wow. uh that this could have big implications possibly for like shake maps or hazard maps or things like that you know if if you know but again never heard of it boomerang earthquakes so Thought I'd just mention it. I'm yeah, intrigued. I'll have, have to check. I'll have to look into that. Uh, it's, it's in uh, Nature of Geoscience. 
Huh. So, okay. Um, Reputable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- this article is just the, the article referencing the paper on physics.org. So, or phys.org, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's really so, cool. Yeah. I feel bad uh, <clears throat> not having read that article that you sent to us last week. <laughs> That's all right. I, I read it and I'm skimming over it now as I'm blurbing away at it. But yeah, yeah so no, that's that's really really cool. Um, so hi. that's all I have for uh, news articles. Nothing crazy. I wouldn't even call that a Jesse's corner. That was more like a you know what would that be? Steve's Steve, Nook. Steve's Nook. There you go. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> uh, Steve's, oh, Steve Stoop. Steve Stoop. There you go. Saddle up to the stoop. <laughs> uh, bring your water ice, kids. Come sit over Steve Stoop. I don't. Oh, God. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> There's like too many jokes in my head. I can't, yeah. I, I, I can't get them out right now. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's jump into the main topic today. Uh, this will be like Marv's corner. This episode of the uh, the final cast. I'm gotta, excited. Yeah. Um, let me pull up the email. All right. Um, We're gonna start with the big one first. I was gonna go, I was gonna go through the email first. Okay. What, cool. Where do you wanna What do you wanna start off with? Yeah, Jesse. Oh. What do you wanna do? No, I t- I didn't. You're I you've you've got. The I, I thought you were going to talk about Benford's law first, but or she was right, the, get, the best for last. Do you want to say that for? I'll say that for last. Okay. Alrighty. I don't know. Whatever. Let's get. Um, all right. This it's like there's a bunch of things here. Okay. He goes first. Uh, maybe cover recover some of the basic principles of geology. Um, uh, you talk a lot about individual pieces, but I'd like to hear some more in-depth coverage of things like cratons, basement rock. All right. Let's uh, let's let's cover cratons slash basement rock really fast. Yeah, so, those are the rocks you find in your basement. Very good. Next yeah. topic. Yeah, okay. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> cratons. This stuff is really old. I, I we've talked. I we've talked a little bit about this. I think I want to say in like a, some recent or more recent episodes. We didn't really go in depth, but uh, I think we might have we might have touched the topic of of craton. Uh, of these cratons so this is kind of think of this is like uh the cratons is like your og crust like this is like some of the oldest rock in the world and this is kind of think of this is like uh like the nucleus of the continents that we have today yeah Um, these these continental crust doesn't recycle so whenever these it's not dense enough to sink back into the mantle if it does recycle or just drops down to the D double prime or whatever. Didn't we talk? Do we talk about that? How slab graveyard? Anyway, yeah. continental crust. <laughs> continental crust. The part of the reason that we have this really old crust is because it doesn't recycle. Right. Yeah. So anyway, sorry. So no, it's good. Mid thought. Great little, great little segue in there. So uh, this stuff's really old. Like uh, I don't know how uh, how are these crate like a billion and a half years old to they yeah, I mean, you billion, can, like two Canadian, billion is, I think, like the oldest, right? Canadian Shield is up to three. Yeah, three? you can you can okay. get into the threes. I think some parts of Australia. Yeah, uh, South Africa. South Africa. <clears throat> yeah, Australia is the Kilbara Craton. <clears throat> anyway. I can't. I can't remember what South Africa's Craton. Uh it's got a lot of A's in it. Capaval, Cap Capval, something like that. Okay, I'll take your probably word. pronouncing that wrong. It's yeah, I think it's I don't know Africana or something. Yeah, but uh, so, so they're old. <laughs> yeah, it's they're old. basically the really old rock. Um, like I said, that's kind of that's what the craton is. Now he asked about the term basement rock. Now that could be a little different than yeah. than craton. Basement rock doesn't have to be as old. Like craton, like I said, like that's OG rock. That's like that's 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 as old as it gets. Basement rock is pretty much any crystalline rock that underlies your sedimentary rock mm-hmm. or your sediments uh they usually tend to be you know you uh, uh, it will either igneous rock or metamorphic rock like they're both well that's the two types of crystalline rock but that's 
that was what if someone said basement rock to me that's that's what i would i would tell you that that's what the first thing would pop into my head so it doesn't have to be like this like two billion year old rock it can be it's it's old but it's not quite as old yeah so that's, you might hear like when people talk about bedrock it's, mm -hmm. it's the same thing essentially yeah. right it's, it's yeah yeah most places the surface has a very thin veneer of sediment but like <clears throat> you know we drill cores on on the east coast um <clears throat> to do a bunch of stuff but one thing is you know we look for water or whatever um <clears throat> and so in in new jersey we drill down about a thousand feet through depending on where we are on the coastal plain but as soon as we hit hard rock as soon as we hit it's basically just metamorphosed but it's old <clears throat> because it's just been sort of sitting there for a while building up sediments but it's in the basement it's down below it's underneath is the stuff that's uh underneath the atlantic coastal plain i don't really know too much about the basement rock underneath there is that all just a continuation of like the schist that kind of like that we see yeah. like in like the, you know, the yeah metamorphic just, belt? yeah it's just weathering yeah it's it's basically i guess it would be schisty i'm trying to think of in maryland it's very um it's granite that's breaking down what's that called it's uh, like a sapro not a saprolite yep. yeah saprolite yeah okay yeah. So that's kind of how you know you're you're hitting it, yeah. It's so like, sap saprolite's like basically, it's kind of like rotten rock. Uh, yeah. Rock that's like decomposing. It's falling apart. It's it's highly weathered rock. Yeah, yeah. It's actually when you drill cores of it, it's actually pretty cool because you pull it out and it it looks like like a piece of granite. You know, it's like black specks, white specks. You know, it looks really cool, but then you grab it and you can like squish it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The whole thing just crumbles and disintegrates yeah, as soon as you take it out of the corner. Literally yeah. just like falls apart because yeah. it's just been weathered. So it's it's the the shape of it's still there. It's still kind of hanging on, but there's there's no more chemical bonds there holding yeah. everything together. That's all been it's broken actually, down. You can kind of think of it as like oh, you can think of the saprolite as like the halfway between like a rock and a soil. Where like it's it's on yeah. its way to becoming yeah. a soil. Yeah, yeah that's a good way to see yeah. rocks breaking down. Um it's just really crappy rock basically <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, it's a bit of a plus too because it just mixes yeah. in with all the if you're looking at yeah. sediment, it just gets chewed up in there and you're like where does the sediment end and the saprolite begin and exactly yeah, yeah so that's when you um, gotta you gotta read your rig is you know is it vibrating different <laughs> are you are, you, are your rotation slowing down are they speeding up what's going on that's it's a great question. Sure. All yeah, those I, are great questions. I, I, I am not a driller. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Craytons, basement rock. Next, he says, uh, basically, why do we have diamonds? All right. Diamonds are a fun topic. Diamonds, uh, we, we talk about kimberlite pipes. Diamonds yeah. come up from the Earth's mantle, and these things are called kimberlite pipes. Um, really just diamond. High pressure and high temperature. There you go. There. So, uh, mm. You know, the beer says diamonds are forever, and that's a bunch of BS. Uh, yes. Diamonds aren't stable at the uh, surface of the earth, and diamonds will actually break down yeah. to graphite right. over a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> not, don't, <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about losing your engagement ring. Uh, yeah. it'll, here's, sweetheart, it'll here's, a, here's a pencil. <laughs> it's going to eventually be graphite anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, no, it, it, that is true. It will break down, but not, not on our lifetimes, not in your great great grandkids lifetimes do you do you know anything about kimberlite pipes i know that the supposedly there's uh these kimberlite pipes are this like it's a pipeline from the mantle the diamond like i said the diamonds are produced in these super um you know high pressure conditions that we see in the earth's mantle and i've heard that you can literally have explosions on the surface of the earth when these kimberlite pipes are just kind of coming up and diamonds will rain down Wait, what uh, because yeah, I heard something about that. I mean, I'm not an expert in Kimberlite pipes, but I heard like something like they can actually like kind of go through the crust. Huh. I'm gonna double check that. I I had not heard that. That's that'd be pretty cool. That would yeah. be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the thing the the diamonds aren't as so diamonds. Everyone knows that diamonds are really expensive, but they are expensive not because they are rare but because there is a monopoly on diamonds. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm totally killing my chances of having De Beers uh, sponsor this podcast right now. <laughs> but uh, let's see. 
the beer is essentially it runs the whole diamond industry and yeah. they, maybe the they'll reason- uh, pay us to shut us up probably not so, to beers if you're listening <laughs> we'll accept bribes <laughs> certain people will i am an <laughs> outstanding citizen i will not have anything to do with that um yeah. so anyway they basically- i'll sell my soul for the right price there you have it <laughs> if if they could make it rain diamonds on me yeah I mean, right <laughs> what uh what what was it there there's like a uh a, a exoplanet or something that the were we talking about this a little while ago yeah. it rains diamonds it's well the the core is supposed to be a diamond right yeah that's i yeah i thought it was something like that but uh I was, yeah i sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there no no i was i was just, i just made me think i i started reading another thing we talked about the ice planet last week or two weeks ago where it's that ice 17 or ice 15 or whatever yeah like black hot ice and uh i started reading a follow-up article on that about how it's you know <clears throat> it, it it is really like confounding some people and it might be like a whole new state of matter but uh so stay tuned i'm gonna i'm gonna look into that a little further very cool but uh kimberly i so they're just basically like pipes of magma brought to the surface is that what we're yeah i'm looking up uh i just want because i just wanted to fact check to make sure from what i heard about kimberly pipes is right and they're volcanic eruptions which bring up basically stuff from deep down inside the uh, earth's mantle where you can get the diamonds and it says here they can be launched up into launched up at 250 kilometers an hour what yeah yeah so it's <clears throat> crazy but i'm showing my ignorance here now so they and they come to so you you mainly find them in the pipe yeah i mean that's where they're mined yeah well would you at the surface <clears throat> Are they like surrounding the pipe then where they've okay. Yeah, like a debris field or something? Yeah. That's actually that's I'm reading it's funny that Steve just said it because I just read a paragraph that says uh basically when these Kimberlite pipe volcanoes you can call them, but when these Kimberlite pipes erupt, they'll produce piles of Vulcan ah broken volcanic debris. Um and the cone is filled with Kimberlite breccia. <laughs> made from magma, xenoliths, and anything yeah. else that gets spit up. Pretty cool. Is that how? Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the, the 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 state park in? Is it Arkansas? Oh, Arkansas, full, yeah. Full, real fast, full circle. Kimberlites are mostly found in the Earth's cratons. So right back to the uh, the first topic we talked about. Yeah. There we go. That may be why he put those questions in that order. Yeah. <laughs> Marv may be smarter than us. But there's there's some that there's well here there's some that are found outside of the Craton, such as Arkansas. There's one in Kentucky yeah. and then the Arkansas one at the state park. Supposedly I heard a story that some kid found like a, a, a diamond in that, that park in Arkansas and it was worth like seventy thousand dollars or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh every few years somebody finds one that's maybe not seventy grand, but you know, that's like a carrot or two or you know pretty big i I don't know what their grading is you know like the flawless and uh was it d i think is the best grade so um but yeah back to your point chris that yes there is a monopoly on diamonds basically there's one company essentially that owns most of the diamond mines in the on the planet and therefore they set the price for what diamonds should cost so they're, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, it was market, I guess is the best way to put also, it. Yeah. Marketing as well, where, cause giving a diamond as an engagement ring is a relatively new. Yeah. Didn't that start in the, I think like uh, World War II, I want to say. Yeah. I think it was a little bit earlier than that, but yeah, it, it's not, it's not as old as you think it is. Yeah. I no, I th- actually, actually like I think De Beers. De Beers started it, right? Isn't that? But De Beers really started uh, dominating the market after World War II, basically when everybody came back from the war and wanted to get married. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so di- uh, man, I'm I'm looking up this article. It's really neat about how uh, all about these Kimberley pipes, and I'll have to post this on the website. You, um, is it? Wasn't isn't there a story about depending, especially if if you're in a certain biome, there's 
a certain type of tree or plant that grows in basically the, the soils that form from kimberlites. So there was like this prospector piece this together. Isn't this what Desmond talked about when he was on the podcast? Did he? Did he well, he said, well, no, Desmond, so in case you haven't listened for the listeners out there, that have, um, we had um, um, uh, this guy Desmond on a couple episodes back and he's, he's a, uh, he's a prospector. And he, um, he was, he was talk, talking about some of the different ways that they, they look for, but he was, he was in, uh, he was looking for metals. He wasn't looking for diamonds. No, yeah. he, was, but yeah. he said that so there were some areas that had, uh, with, uh, was it arsenic? He said, you basically get these like barren areas where nothing's yeah. growing. And then yeah, I think, he did say something about vegetation because certain, certain plants, vegetation, like the, oh, I'll have to listen to the episode again. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. But, Anyways, but yes, Jesse, there's, um, there's certain, sometimes you can look at the, just the vegetation and, and get a, get a feel for what, what minerals or, you know, precious metals or things like that are, are in the ground at that area. So, but with regard to plate tectonics though, they don't, the Kimberlite pipes don't affect plate tectonics. Yeah. They like hot spots. What, are, what were we, what are we? Yeah, because it, 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 uh, Mars' question was, uh, you know, diamonds, right? Question mark. And maybe the role they played in the formation of or perhaps the influence of rifting tectonic plates, continents. Yeah. Uh, well, one interesting thing about the diamonds also is that most of these Kimberlite pipes are really old, but there's a couple that might be younger. Like there's one in Tanzania that might be ten to 20,000 years old. Oh, whoa, that's really young. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, don't be like, don't be expecting to see these Kimberlite eruptions and just, you know, spitting out diamonds and. <laughs> yeah, are, are the diamonds I, hot? Like, would you? I would imagine they'd be getting lukewarm. rained on by diamonds. I'm getting burned a lot, right? I mean, that's yeah. like literally first world problems, then, right? If you're getting rained on by diamonds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I'm, I'm assuming it's a volcanic eruption. It's going to be hot. Wow, and then. Wow, these these Kimberlite explosions. I'm looking at this stuff. This is like crazy how fast this stuff is moving through the uh, um, through the Earth's crust. I, this is wow. I'm really happy Marv uh, asked this question because I'm. This is a really. Uh, we'll have to talk about these Kimberlite pipes. This is really interesting stuff. All right. Uh, you want to move so, on? But, the- yeah, but just to answer his question, I don't think it has oh. any. I don't think it plays any influence in plate tectonics. It's, yeah it's I kind mean, of just like a, a conduit from the mantle on so like jesse said kind of like a hot spot but uh yeah but hot spots tend to be there and be active for longer periods of time so i don't know what we, i thought all kimberly pipes were like old old but yeah if you I just thought- said 20 to thirty thousand years old then that blows that theory out of the water yeah i just and for some maybe it's just because i I think I, I knew about the craton because you find you find them in South Africa, you find them in yeah, it's, Canada and Siberia, and I just maybe I'm always assuming oh you're on the craton the craton is really old yeah that but, I think that's where my head was yeah, going with that as well so I maybe mean, we should just be diamond prospectors we really I'm in yeah I'm in. Right. We'll just do this. walking around outside waiting for diamonds to rain on us <laughs> I'll just carry you like an upside down umbrella. <laughs> a diamond um- <laughs> I was gonna say I'm gonna invest all my money in a diamond umbrella. <laughs> I like Very it. Good. Very good. I, I like I like where this is going. Yeah. Then the diamonds hit it and they all shatter. <laughs> 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 all right, moving on. Uh speaking of rifting, I'm always jonesing to hear about the East African Rift Valley. Yes, we can talk a lot. We can talk about the East African Rift Valley. Um uh, all right, so let's just do a brief, in case, uh, a brief rundown on the East African Rift Valley. Um, if you've never heard of it, it is located in Eastern Africa. What? Um, yes, right. Who would have thought? Didn't <laughs> see that one coming. <laughs> so uh, let's see. It runs down, like I said, Eastern Africa, and it's actually part of a. Well, let's see. The, it's it's before I get into like this location, it's part of where what's actually happening is uh, that portion of Africa is splitting open. All right. It's, it's rifting. And so like we see 
a couple of different places on Earth today that has active rifting. Probably the best example would be the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where the uh, you know the, the Atlantic Ocean is spreading open, and it's doing so at a rate of about two centimeters a year, and that's about how fast your fingernails grow, which is it's a little bit on the slower side for when you look at uh, plate tectonics and how fast uh, some of these some of these plates are moving around. But um, so that's what happens, and so. The Atlantic Ocean opened, or it split open, it opened up when, as a result, well, we had Pangaea, the form that was when North America collided with Eurasia, Africa, and South America. Um, we had just this, you know, this mega, mega continent, the supercontinent. It split yeah. open Pangea. and, Pan, yeah, and it split open. And as, you know, it, as these continents are rifting, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until finally it's so thin and it's depressed that it, it, not depressed like it's sad, but it's depressed like it's being pushed out. <laughs> I can't take so it anymore. <laughs> I really I can't deal with breakups. It's just, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's having a rough breakup. And so it fills up with water. It fills up and then, and then it gets big enough and then it uh, forms an ocean. So if yep. you want to think about like where like a baby ocean is today, it's actually the Red Sea. The Red Sea, the, the Arabian Peninsula is separating from africa as well and and, uh northeast africa and um yeah so the arabian peninsula used to be part of the african mainland and now it's not rifting there and it got to the point where it was it was it was so so thin and so kind of like i said like uh low lying that the ocean water just kind of filled in flooded the whole thing out and so give it like another 30 million years 50 million years and it too will be a ocean uh, 10 million. Well, 10 million, it'll break off. Look at this guy. This guy's like, yeah, I'm waiting. He's got the, uh, you know, sometimes you go to a bar, you set the countdown to St. Patrick's Day in the bar. He's got the countdown to when the, when the Red Sea becomes an ocean. I don't know. It's a really, really, really big clock. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So the East African Rift Valley, where it isn't, it isn't low lying enough that it's filling up with ocean water, but it, you do see a lot of linear lakes really going deep, a, deep yeah lakes. yeah and that's just because like I said, the it basically the continent's pulling apart yeah um so one of the things that is the you know the next thing to talk about is what's what's fueling this and so obviously we don't geologists don't know for sure but uh it seems like there is a super plume coming up from the mantle um and usually we see this uh we call the uh, they're known as divergent boundaries where the plates are moving away from each other everything's splitting apart and um it looks like there is a just a giant plume of hot like superheat superheated rock at the bottom of the earth's mantle and they've done and it seems like that's kind of splitting up into smaller plumes towards the top of the earth's mantle uh, it's been it's pretty cool. They've looked at the geochemistry of the rocks at the East African Rift Valley, and they can tell that there's several different plumes, several different mantle plumes that are associated with the splitting of this um, of this portion of Africa. So yeah, based on uh, its geochemistry. So this this plume is made up of X, Y, and Z. This plume is made of you know A, B, and C. This plume is made out of you know L, M, N, O, P. Mm-hmm. So you can look at uh, basically every every plume is going to have its own, you know, uh, geochemical signature, right? It's yeah. going to create certain minerals, right? It, and, and sense, yeah, if, if they all came from the same exact spot, they should all have the same exact geochemical signature, but they yeah. don't. Yeah, which, yeah. Which indicates that they're coming from different locations. Yeah. So yeah. I <clears throat> actually one of one of uh, my peers when I was doing my PhD, she worked in East Africa doing geochemistry of the igneous bodies. And I remember always being like, what, what are you doing exactly? Uh, <laughs> and, but I remember at her PhD defense being like, oh man, that's really cool. Like, I, <clears throat> I wish I would have understood it more when you were sort of explaining it in the hallway. <laughs> um, because I would have asked a million more questions, but yeah, so there was some thought if if there's like a a big blob lower that is just split off into three 
So she was sort of looking at <clears throat> if there was a main igneous body that fractionated. And so you could see the different fractionations because if it travels further, it's going to like cool off by the time it gets up to one spot versus if it's taking a straight path, it's going to be hotter. And oh, so it cools yeah. off, <clears throat> you, would, you were going to see different minerals because different stuff is going to solidify. It was really interesting. I yeah, don't, reaction series. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, we covered this <laughs> in an in a early podcast episode again, about Bowens. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can revisit that. Yeah, because uh, Marv does ask us to go into some basics on physical geology and things like that. So we could always do that. Um, the world is our oyster. Well, I think about it like, you know, there's a million geology professors out there looking for uh, lectures on <laughs> a million different things because they have to now post them online instead of teaching them <laughs> in person. So <laughs> um, if, you, if you know anyone, yeah, send them our way. Yeah, if you want to cover, if you want us to cover a topic because you don't want to cover it, yeah. Oh, what is? Isn't it? Uh, tell somebody August. What, what's what's this month's? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell a friend August. I think it was. It was something that rolled off the tongue like that. And it ran into. <laughs> don't forget about me, September. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Followed by I'm still here, October. <laughs> it's Friday. I'm in love. What? Yeah. Hey, oh, there you go. Full circle. Um <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, you guys want to add anything else about the East African Rift Valley? Uh it's just it's just really cool. It's, it's a really, really unique place on the planet, right? And now. it's it's likely and we should probably we should actually probably spend some time covering it because you know it's the birthplace of humans. Oh, uh, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, those things. So we likely <laughs> came out of the, the Rift Valley. It's you know, it's where we evolved. So, um, and it's, it's likely due uh, in large part to, to these very unique conditions that are going on there. So how cool was that? Let's, uh, let's, I, let's, let's stick a little bookmark on the East Africa. Yeah. Valley maybe and we'll do devote some more time to it. Yeah. And it sounds like we know at least a few people who've worked there, you yeah. know, in all different capacities. So maybe we'll get a special yeah. guest on or something. Yeah. Yeah, I get a good friend of the show, Alex Brittenham, back talking about archaeology there. Oh, right. Yeah. Full circle. There you and go. Yeah, that's, Bill, that's Bill, Lucan's, Bill Lucan studies soils there, but it's not, not as interesting. But without the soils, <laughs> yeah. Bill, I hope you're listening. Bill, I really hope you heard that. <laughs> I can just, I can just see him like listening by like some old timey radio. I, know, I just imagine Bill listening to this, and just thinking like, "Damn you, Steve!" <laughs> Peterson. <laughs> no, what Bill stuff. does is is very, very exciting. It just doesn't pertain to uh, the igneous body differentiation. Is what what I was trying to. Ex- that's good. Uh, he still, he still, I'll speak for Bill. He still hates you. Right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> he's, yeah. Yeah. He's got a lifelong ven, vendetta against you. Now. Hey, listen, it's not the first time I put my foot in my mouth and it probably won't be the last. Time, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let me pull the email back up. Okay. So East African Rift Valley. Okay. Then he asks, and this is a geological non, non, anomalies. anomalies. Um, I don't do, know. Do, 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 do. Mana, mana. I don't know what he means by anomalies. Yeah. Um, you guys? No, I was, I was actually gonna say let's skip this one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's he talks about nonconformities and all things that made early geologists perhaps question their assumptions. That, that's. Oh, okay. I, I see uh, what you're saying. Okay. Almost every single outcrop that I've ever been to makes me think like, oh. As soon, as soon as I think, okay, I know what's going on here, I instantly doubt myself <laughs> because I've been so wrong so many other times. Yeah, I mean, we could talk real fast about unconformities since he's got uh, mentioned nonconformities in there. And that, that's, it, 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 things can get tricky. Um, I guess, uh, I, so the main thing, I, speaking from as being a sedimentologist, the number one thing that will screw you up in interpreting an outcrop is if, there, if your outcrop's been flipped over, if there's been some kind of, um, I guess, uh, you see this a lot working in Appalachian geology. 
the, the structural geology in the Appalachians is, is really cool. We see lots of folds and things like that, but sometimes when rock gets folded up, when two continents collide, you can actually get the rock being flipped upside down. And so when you're looking at an outcrop and what you think is up is actually down and, you know, and vice versa. So that, that for me is, that's always like my greatest fear when you're working at least in, you know, in Appalachian geology, like, okay, is up, up. And there's, there's different things that you can look at to make sure that, you know, what's up is up. But it's always, it's always a good question to ask, which way is up? Yes. Which way is up. Yeah. Just that's usually one of the first things you look at. No. And most um, students just like point up. Like, which way's up that way <laughs> so um so like when you ask which way is north and they point up, point up yeah. <laughs> yes yes i've seen many i've seen that done many times um what else what else could uh make geologists question well like a non, geologists question their assumptions. a non-conformity guess, you have all these layers you know and you think you know what's going on you think you know what's going on and then you know but then you, you, you take your samples back to the lab and it turns out that, you know, these, these dates are saying it's 50,000 years old. And then the dates just above it are saying it's like 4,000 years old. <laughs> well, how, how does it go from 50 to four? Like it, a non-conformity, basically a, a period of non-deposition or erosion. So either nothing was deposited or it was deposited and then removed and then something else came on top of it. But to the naked eye or to the, you know, general observer, it looks like it's just one nice stratigraphic column going straight up, but really you have a big chunk of missing time. So that can really screw you up. Well, yeah, that's, that's an unconformity. Um, uh, non, uh, nonconformity is, is a very specific type of unconformity. So uh, a nonconformity is when you have, uh, crystalline rock, either um, igneous or metamorphic, coming in contact with sedimentary rock. And so what ends up happening is there's a big time gap, like what Steve said with, uh, you know, for whatever reason, if you get no deposition occurring, whatever, but uh, a nonconformity specifically, it's all that stuff that Steve said, but it specifically has crystalline rock coming in contact with sedimentary rock. Right. So yeah, it's, it's like having, you just, you're missing a lot of time, like, like Steve said. Um, what else? What else could be geological anomalies? Um, there's all, I mean, like it's, that's kind of like the sky's the limit with, with the kind of like, yeah, there's, there's always weird things happening. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I was just going to say, and that's, I think part of what he's saying is like, how do you figure these things out? Yeah. And we always have different oh. ways of approaching a problem. You always got to yeah. check yourself. Or you yeah. wreck yourself. That's always that's my motto. It's on my field book. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was the new motto you wanted, Jesse? Ride or die? Is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the yeah. He, right. he, you know, he very uh, specifically just put drew one line through check yourself before you wreck yourself, and then wrote ride or die. Because <laughs> you know he's he's good at taking notes. You know you don't want to cross it out. You just want to put a strike through. <laughs> yeah. Um. So it's there's the thing about geology is whenever like you're studying an outcrop or a geologic formation or or whatever you're doing even a mineral anything like yeah it's 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 not going to be like what you see in your textbook it's going to be it's always so much more complicated you'd never ever see textbook scenarios like outside it's always there's there's always so it's always much more complicated at least in my experience it, than just what you might see in your textbook it is and it's Something too where I feel like a lot of times, uh, especially s students that that I see in like my sedimentology class, where like you'll go over what different environments produce and like what you should see, and then you actually go out and look at an outcrop, and you'll always have a few students who are just very upset <laughs> that it's not checking all the boxes. Yeah, and you're like, well, you know, it, you just you just got to go with what you can see and, and make your sort of best inference. And as long as you can back it up, you, you're going to be, but there's going to be unknowns. Yeah. Yeah. There's always yeah. going to be unknowns. Yeah. There's a fairly famous outcrop that was very well documented, very well studied. Um, like 
low and stuff like people like very people high up in their field and then there's this other group of scientists that look at the same outcrop and actually came up with a different interpretation and you read both interpretations based on the stratigraphic record and they both kind of make sense (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and well, it's like well you know if i read this paper first i would think okay you're correct and then if i read this paper second i'd be like well that doesn't sound right because that's not what it was said here but then if you look at it totally objectively it's like well they could both be right but obviously they both can't be right because they kind of contradict each other so what's going on are you talking about a certain formation in pennsylvania no 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 this uh, uh this was uh uh, okay, I, we don't have to get into specifics. Yeah, but no, this was out in uh, Utah, maybe. I oh, okay. Anyway, oh, all right, all right. or Arizona, some, somewhere out west. But uh, yeah, it, it was it was a case study we had to do in my uh, sedimentary petrology class. You actually had to uh, like, okay. read these yeah. two papers, both both interpreting the same outcrop and but coming up with different outcomes. The Happy Jack <laughs> Formation, right? I forget Arkansas. <laughs> I think is it Arkansas? Anyway, I think I'm, yeah, 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 I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe, I pre- maybe I was way off. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it, it's, it's always like Jesse, like Jesse and Steve were saying, it's always much more complicated. And it, it's unfortunately, there's just not like two or three things that can kind of like trip you up. Um, you know, I mean, and, and it's, like I said, as long as you can just kind of back up your facts, why'd you say it? I mean, hell, Jesse and I are working on a, a project right now and we're still trying to figure out what the heck this thing is from, um, you know, and it's just, it's just, you know, we have an idea. It's not like you're totally clueless, but it's like, it could be one thing or it could be another thing. So it's, it's always just, you just gotta just, you know, here's my facts and this is my interpretation based on. It was uh, these facts. dinosaur hot tubs, right? Is that what it was? <laughs> dinosaur hot tubs? Yeah. It's sure. Just a bunch of like T-Rexes would make their own hot tubs and they would just sit in it and chill. <laughs> No. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. a different project? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I said too much. <laughs> <laughs> They're giving it away. Giving it away. <laughs> um, <laughs> scoop us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and then uh, moving on, he goes. Uh, Finally, things like Yardangs, Ventifax, Hoodoos. All right. He's talking about some uh, Aeolian geomorphology right there. Um, so let's, uh, let's break these down first. Um, do you guys want me to take these or do you guys want to, <clears throat> you, you're yeah, the, go, you're cause the I have a, Aeolian guy. yeah, I have a vague recollection <laughs> of what each of them is, but and I could not give you a good definition right That's now. No. We call you Mr. Aeolian. <laughs> Nobody has ever called me that <laughs> ever. <laughs> and you, you'd be very disappointed if you would call me that, uh, um, ne- next week. Hi, this is Steve. This is Jesse, and this is Mr. Aeolian. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so uh, he, so Aeolian features um, are uh, wind. They, they come from basically wind. All right? Wind derived. Uh, yes. So things like dunes would be Aeolian features, but so what a yardang is, it is like this elongated. Uh, bedrock kind of sticking out of the ground um, and it's it's oh this is really hard to explain on a podcast if I had a picture yeah. here you, all I would have to do is just show the pictures yep. there, there's, there, there's your there. yard dang um, think of it like a fin okay like a series of fins kind of sticking up out of the ground and they're all elongated in the same direction and uh, that's that's what a, a yard dang is it's just it's all from the, the, the prominent wind direction just wind blowing and, and kind of uh, just braids that material down over time and it creates these these fins. So that's a that's a yardang. Um, what was the next one? Ventifax, right? So the next thing he said. Yep. Uh, Ventifax. Once again, it's also uh, forms from from uh, from wind, and there are these these rocks that are in the ground, and they are they can be either abraded, pitted, etched grooved or, or polished down but it's all just kind of forming once again from from uh from the sand that's in the wind it's kind of sandblast this stuff and um yeah at, the, at like the granular level too sometimes yeah. i mean usually it's a rock that you can see but <clears throat> you can look under a microscope and see you know 
grains all pitted from the same direction because if there's preferential wind that's how these things are forming preferential wind movement Mm -hmm. they're going to preferentially weather one side of the rock and so they they create this pitted or sandblasted face Mm -hmm. yeah um so those are vent effects um like i said it's, it's hard to hard to talk about these things uh when you can't see the actual pictures of them and um the last hoodoos. thing we talked about was hoodoos. <laughs> so hoodoos are, uh, once again, they're, they're um, these Aeolian features, but they kind of look like uh, these like chimneys sticking up out of the ground. And I know you see them in like, um, is it, uh, what's the? Wiley it, Coyote. What, actually kind of like that territory, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think, uh, so you see them in like uh, Bryce Canyon National Park. and Ar- Arches. The, uh, I don't know if you'd see them in, I was just at Arches in November. I don't remember seeing any. They, they might be there. I would be surprised. But think of them. They kind of look like totem poles, all right? They're these kind of like towers sticking up. And they're uh, the thing about the hoodoos are is uh, that they are not. It's not like a, like a a regular shaped column, all right? Like the diameter kind of changes a little bit as it's going up. And and um, I think the best way to describe them, just kind of like if you ever seen like a like a like a totem pole, how it looks like it's kind of like a, almost like a lake of sausages almost. I, I don't know any other way to describe it. I just want to hear you, uh, you come up with uh, analogies here. <laughs> no, it's so hard because you guys can't see any pictures of this, and I'm just trying to describe it, and it's yeah. just the uh, so those are those are hoodoos. So. Um, that's it for the for the alien stuff he asked about. Um, what's what's next on the list here? Description of the geologic time scale. Um, let's save that I, one. Let's yeah, again, we we have done a podcast on this time scale, yeah. so if you go back in the archives, you can look it up. But yeah, I agree with Jesse. I think we should revisit this. Mark it down on the whiteboard, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think we should right. cover the big <laughs> one. I think we should. Just well. Get- yeah, let's get to our. Uh... Well, real fast, we can say a couple things about the geologic time scale. They're broke. Uh, a lot of the, or we have significant breaks in the geologic time scale, occur when we see these uh, these huge changes on Earth. A lot of them, or not a lot, or we do see them when uh, there's things like mass extinction events can happen. Uh, that's you know, I feel like every episode we talk about the KT boundary here. Yeah, but, um, uh, but he does ask, like, how can someone remember those dates? And uh, a great professor once taught me, oh, dude, Pete tried crack. <laughs> was that five, ma- five mass extinctions? Yeah, uh, I, I guess there's probably, what, six or seven now? Like, if you uh, talk about the Eocene. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the current ones. ones. Yeah, there's some smaller ones. Yeah, it's... It's it's crazy when you look at the geologic time scale and you look at the breaks and you realize that most of these divisions and most of these like uh, categories, the, the epochs and the eons and the periods were placed before we had anywhere, any way to numerically date them to like put an age mm-hmm. on them. Yeah, like yeah. They did it before we had radiometric dating or anything. It was just all based on sort of like fossil succession. Fossil, and, yeah. It's it's kind of crazy when you when you when you sort of think about when you look at all of the nuance there, and mm-hmm. but that also does explain the fact that you know, it it's a time scale, but it's not it's not a yep. linear scale. You know, like one one section to another section, one section might be fifty million years, <laughs> the next section might only be twenty million years. Yeah, if you look, I mean, if you look at it, and we can link, we could throw a link to the GSA from I think they updated it last year yeah last year 2019 um there's four columns and the three three of the columns <laughs> represent 500 million years and the fourth column represents you know four billion years yeah so they're mm-hmm. not they're not <clears throat> sc- scaled like you said yeah so the the mass extinctions are ordovician endivonian Permian, which is a big one because like 95% of all life on the planet died. Uh, Triassic, the KPG, no, 
Triassic. Yeah, and Triassic. And Triassic. Then the Cretaceous. Uh, the KPG boundary. That was 65 million years ago ish. It, it it dances around 65 to 66, depending yeah. upon. They they keep updating Current, it. So currently 66. Okay. Um, if you're keeping tabs. But yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it is the story of it is like super interesting. Um, even the story about like trying to put numerical dates on it because it really changes. It's like a revolution in how you think about time going from the earth is young to the earth is old to the earth is very old. Yeah. Like it, Crazy. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll get into that more Marv, but that's, that's the gist of it. So uh, as far as the, the times, the, uh, I have all those numbers in my head, but again, they're rough. Like and Permian was what? 255? 252? 252. Yeah, 252. So, I, you know, again, they're all in there somewhere. But <laughs> uh, at one point as a geology student, you will have to major, uh, you will have to memorize the major, uh, or at least you should have to. <laughs> <laughs> memorize the major events on the geologic time scale. Uh, so it's in there somewhere, but again, it gets updated every, I don't know, decade about or, yeah, like, um, like I, I have a big, a I have a big book from 2004 and I think it's been updated twice since then. Like Jesse said in 2019, I want to say it was like 2014 or something like that. So, and then it gets to the point where you've been doing this long enough. You're like, ah, I memorized this back in the day. I remember back when, yeah, now, this period ended whatever you know however many million years ago we and still call it the kt boundary <laughs> <laughs> so and then and you're like ah, i'm done i'm done updating this in my head i just closed it up now you shouldn't but um i know there's been several since i had to learn as an undergrad there's been several iterations of it or the updates of it so, all right so um, yes marv we hit most of your topics but one more one more easy one on this email um he goes uh What's this about water deep in the Earth's mantle and or core? Um, so this was a, I think what he's talking about is, so there's not like inside the Earth's mantle, there's not like oceans, like, you know, you'd see, but you would think, but there is, there's a lot of water inside the mantle. And back in, we actually did an episode about this back in 2014, back when we did the, the podcast, oh. the first round of the podcast we did. Um, there is a discovery of a new mineral called ringwoodite. Ringwoodite, yeah. yeah. And it is a hydrous mineral, which means that there's an H2O molecule in this thing. And, um, and so it's, there's, the water is all locked up in the minerals. There's, no, there's not this like free-flowing ocean inside the Earth's mantle. You would have to, in order to, ex you'd have to in order to access that water, you have to figure out a way to extract it from the from the ringwoodite. But anyways, so they found this mineral, uh, ringwoodite, it's found in the earth's mantle. And they're like, holy crap, there's actually, there's water in this mineral. And this thing could be pretty prevalent inside the earth's mantle. And so that's what they're talking about, water inside the, water inside the earth's mantle. Um, and it had some implications for potentially where the, how did the oceans form? That was a, a debate for a while. Um, People had many hypotheses. One hypothesis, I don't think people actually subscribe to this hypothesis anymore, but for a little bit, they threw on the idea. Maybe it came from comets. You know, comets are just big ice and dust balls, you know, flying around. Maybe get impacted, Earth got impacted with comets. But I think now that it's pretty much, pretty much accepted that the oceans came from volcanic degassing, the water coming out from, from, from volcanoes, essentially. As water vapor, and they think that this could have there was this ringwoodite has water in it, and that could have been the source for the water on the oceans, volcanic degassing. There you go. Boom. That was, that was neat. You put a little bow on that. That was nice. You're yeah. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, the last one, the bonus topic. This is actually a fun one. I was I did a little research on this one this afternoon because I wasn't familiar with this topic for the life of me at all. So uh, I learned something new today. Okay, so finally, Marv said, uh, 
uh, see, I watched an episode of a new show on Netflix called Connections. Um, it was the episode that I watched was focused on Benford's Law. Uh, and there's something to point out how this law applied to earth sciences and particularly the size of, volca uh, of a volcano called there. So, um, so he, he just wanted to know if we could comment on Benford's Law and how it... Uh, how it's connected in the earth sciences. So let's break down what Benford's law is. So this is actually, so if you haven't watched the show on Netflix, it's called Connections. It's pretty cool. They have a, they have a whole episode um, all about, about how this uh, Benford's law came about and, and what it is. But to, in a nutshell, uh, there's really, they talk about like you would think that like in nature, there'd be like a lot of like random numbers, but it's really kind of not <laughs> random numbers. And, you know, before I think about this for a second, and so how, how Benford's law works is you take whatever number you have in your, in your data set, you take the first digit of it and just look at that. And it's something like 30% of all the numbers in nature, I guess it's in nature, in a, in a, in a natural data set, 30% of the numbers should start with the number one. And then the number, and then like 17% of the numbers start with the number two and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go out to 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 the number nine so like uh for example like if your number like if, if your number 100 right starts with one so 30 percent of the numbers which should, should start with the number one and we see this they talked in the, in the episode on this netflix show connections they talked about how um it's likely that this is how the irs looks at your tax documents to to try to detect fraud uh, and there's all sorts of like it's 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 actually kind of a crazy concept this Benford's law and um, so like theoretically if you're cheating on your taxes the numbers in your in your in your tax return wouldn't follow Benford's law so yeah they went into some stuff like that they went into it's actually tied to elections and all, all sorts of crazy stuff uh, I'll leave you guys to watch the the uh, the Netflix show to to look at that stuff but at the very end of the episode they had. Uh, two geologists on there uh, that studied volcanoes and they applied, they went, wanted to see if Benford's law applied to uh, these data sets from volcanoes. And what they found was that yes, the Benford's law actually applies to, um, uh, what was it? It was area of the volcano and um, geez, there was a second, there was a second, uh, um, there's the a second. collapse called errors. Yeah. Was that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the whole, the big thing was that mother nature was following Benford's law, which is pretty cool. Like I said, huh. I, I'd never, I, I just watched the show today to kind of prep quickly for this, uh, for this podcast, but it was, it was really neat. Um, then, then, they find in the, the episode ended that it's not only just on earth that follows Benford's law. Um, I think exoplanets should, and uh, not, other, other planets, I'm sorry, not exoplanets. I forgot I said that other planets in the solar system uh, follow Benford's law as well. So it's just this um, kind of, this, it's uh, just the way that the numbers come out from data in, in nature. And um, so Marv asked us if we could comment on this. And to be completely honest with you, I never, like I said, I never heard of this before today, uh, but this sounds absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, the, I said this, like, I watched the whole episode. And it sounds that, fake. It does sound fake. <laughs> it, it sounds really, fake. It, no. And that's what the whole episode was. Like this thing's like a pile of BS. Like this is like, there's no way, but it's like, no, actually like this, these numbers are like, this is just the way when you have natural data sets, they'll follow this pattern. That's crazy. So, and they have like conventions. You can go to a Benford's Law convention. And let me tell you. <laughs> Ain't no party like a Benford party. Do they know the statistical breakdown of all the people yeah. who are there? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I show up. They're like, I'm sorry, son. You don't, you don't belong here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Do you guys have anything to comment about benford's law no uh, then it just, away. yeah it's I, crazy it's yeah i'm interested to see and i was it, yeah i was i was saying i was i was telling before we started that 
my office mate teaches a class and one of the things he does a scientific literacy class and they teach about um, correlation and they go over data and all this data analysis. And so I've listened to him tell me about Ben Fritz law. And I always remember being like, yes, that's interesting. But I guess I really wasn't paying attention. Sorry, Tim. Because <laughs> uh, now like actually sitting here and listening, like that's, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of astonished. I need to think about this. I need to think about my life. <laughs> no, it's, it sounds really interesting. Um, I mean, and the one example that they gave uh, in the TV show was how it applies to elections. And so like, say that you want to vote for one candidate, right? But this candidate has no chance of winning, right? And so you're like, oh, I, I don't want to just vote. I don't want to waste my vote on that person. Let me just, you know, like hold my nose and, and vote for, you know, someone else kind of that does have it, you know, uh, that does have a chance of winning. And they say when people do this, it actually doesn't, it throws Benford's law out of, the, 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 I'm sorry, the data does not follow Benford's law. Does hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just, yeah. It's so, it's just wild. Um, yeah, because I was sitting there today watching this, and I was just like, "How the heck is this? How does that happen? How did?" You know? So, but that's that's essentially Benford's law in a nutshell. I like I said, I've never never dealt with this before, but it sounds super interesting, and it sounds super fun to kind of play around with and see what the you know what the limitations of this thing are. Um. So I think that covers everything that Marv asked. That was a, that was a really fun one. Um, yeah. Marv, yeah, Marv. Kept, kept us on our toes for, for that one. Oh, it was pretty cool because we weren't just kind of rambling on about one topic. We were, uh, we're rambling on about multiple topics. Rambling <laughs> about multiple topics, you know. I learned – no, that was, that was really cool because I learned a bunch of stuff just kind of doing some, some quick and dirty research for this, uh, for this episode. So some of the stuff I knew, some of the stuff I didn't know. So it yep. was always, always fun. So um, I think that's, uh, is that going to wrap it up for today? I think so. Just don't, yeah. don't forget. Uh, we appreciate our Patreons. Marv is a Patreon. He got to ask us all these questions today. So please, if you have uh, two or five or $10 to spare, please uh, consider donating. Also, for all of your formatting needs, please check out the formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. Um, uh, check us out on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, Instagram is pretty weak at the moment, but we're, we're, we're building that up. Um, but yeah. It's, and also it's tell a friend <laughs> August. Yeah. So make sure you tell a friend in August. We, uh, we have one week, two weeks left of our contest. Oh yeah, yeah, we're, your, we're, yes. we're, yeah. We we should wrap that up soon, probably. Um, <laughs> left it open ended. Uh, we will. Let's. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the. Uh, we'll do it this week. We'll, uh, if you want to. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, we'll give you one more week. So. So then it'll Tuesday be the twenty fifth. All right. We're going to shut it down, and then we'll well, we should, we'll do our voting. We should shut it down the twenty fourth because that's when we. Do you want to announce the winner next week on the podcast? I was going to say we could vote next week while we're all together and then announce it the week after that. Oh, okay. So we'll announce. Okay. Okay. So we'll shut it down the 25th. Okay. Yeah. Got, okay. I see what you're saying. All right. Yep. You got one more week. Get your, uh, your, so in case you haven't listened to any of the past episodes, uh, picture of your favorite rock in your rock collection. We got some, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's just something and, fun and, we came up with. The yes. Top of our heads. Uh, your favorite rock preferably in your rock collection like some some people have sent us pictures of like mountaintops and outcrops like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> which which is fine hey i'm not here to they're it's fun it's fun yeah but uh you, you get more bonus points if you actually have it so just keep that in mind um, yeah so so, so we'll, we'll end it on the 25th and then we will post the winner on tuesday september 1st um which is actually going to be our 59th episode i believe right Whew. crazy so um 
Oh, hey, and then um, real fast before we end today, uh, I want to make two more announcements. Uh, shout out to uh, Nathaniel uh, on Facebook. He sent us a picture that he took of the comet Neowise. And, uh, Ooh, jealous. Yeah, jealous. really, really awesome picture. of. Uh, he did a 10-minute exposure. Um, Holy cow, that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, so he sent us that on Facebook. So, I don't know, send us some pictures. If you got any, I don't know, naturally occurring phenomena that you yeah. have photographed. We like seeing those things. So thanks a lot to Nathaniel for sending that out. Um, shout outs to him. Yeah. And then also don't forget to, uh, if you like the news stories, if you're interested in the news stories we talk about in the podcast, I feel like I always forget to, to mention this, check out our website, geologyflannelcast.com, where we post the podcast. We also post the links to uh, the stories we talk about this week. So if you want to do some more, if you want to read up some more on some of the topics that we talked about, check them out on uh, geologyfinalcast.com. Yeah. And I think that wraps it up for the day. Cool. Anything else you gentlemen like to add? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <clears throat> Until next week. I have nothing to add. Uh, very good. You heard it here. All right. <laughs> Steve, you good to go? I am good to go, Chris. All right. Thanks, everyone, so much for listening. I uh, appreciate uh, our listeners. We love you guys, and we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.